Ja, herzlich willkommen zur diesjährigen Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to this year's presentation of the 2022 Obermeier Awards. This year, too, we are meeting online. Um, good evening to our virtual audience and good evening to the award winners who are also following us online. And welcome to the jury and the members of the family Obermeier. My name is Shelley Kupferberg, and I'm delighted to have the chance to guide you tonight through the event. First of all, I'd like to take the opportunity and say thanks to the interpreters who do their best to make sure that both the English and German-speaking audience can follow, thanks to Perissa Parza and Stefan Hotstein. As you can see, I'm in the plenary hall of the Berlin House of Representatives. This house has been the host and location of the presentation of the Obermeier Awards for many years. And tonight, I'm not alone, but by my side is Dennis Buchner, the Speaker of the Berlin House of Representatives. You have been the host um, of this event for many years now. Why is that? Well, for us, this is a perfect opportunity to mark the anniversary of the liberation of Auschwitz. We do different things. We have uh, this form of cooperation with the Obermeier family, and we have an event that we do with young people. The awards are now being presented to the for the 22nd time, a wonderful projects that have been distinguished, people who work for um, the remembrance and the study of German Jewish history, and this is something that is remarkable, um, projects that have not just focused on looking back into history, but also look into the future. We've met wonderful people throughout the years with the, the awardees, and I'm happy that we're doing it again. You just said it. For the 22nd time, the awards are being presented today. This is wonderful. And you already mentioned what is so special about this prize, in your opinion. Can you maybe rephrase? Well, I think the regional edge to it is something that makes it very special. I talked about it to Joel Obermeier this afternoon, um, how they manage to find these wonderful awardees. But what they do is look across Germany in all the regions. It's mostly very ordinary people who have put, uh, who have made a superhuman effort in um, in their projects, and most of them have um, are not doing this work as their occupation, but privately. So thank you, uh, Dennis Buchner, for having us once again um, here at the Berlin House of Representatives. Well, now I have the honor to present the president of the jury, Zahn Hama, the director and general manager of the Turo College Berlin. Zahn Hama, you have been part of this project from the outset for 22 years now, so this award has a very long tradition. I'm always astonished how many of these wonderful projects can be found across Germany that study the history of Jews in Germany. How difficult was it to make a choice this year? Well, it's always a challenge to, to make a pick who will win and who won't. But I, I think we did make a good choice and choose those who really deserve it. But it's just a limited number always. You, they can probably reapply next year, can't they? If you look back, how did the projects which won change, did they change at all? Well, um, something was another a dimension was added to to the awards, which is um, the initiative widen the, the circle, and this has something different to it. So what we did in the past was focus on the preservation of history, remembrance. We chose projects and initiatives who focused on preserving 
Jewish history, but now we're also looking into the future. We will hear more about Widen the Circle um, in a moment. It is an initiative that includes the Obermeyer Awards, um, an initiative that is also was also launched by the Obermeyer family. You are a founding member of the Jutura College Berlin, which includes a master degree on um, commemoration studies and um, the history of the Holocaust. A lot has been done over the past decades, especially in West Germany, when it comes to uh, history preservation and coming to terms with the past. But what about the future? of remembrance. Well, we know that contemporary witnesses are will not be there with us forever. It's something that you can't do anything about. So we need to find another way to remember. In Judaism, remembering is something very special and very important. We do it in every service. We remember the, those who passed away. It's very important to us to keep doing it. But it's really wonderful to see that our German fellow citizens take this matter seriously and try to, to, to preserve our memory. Well, how this works will probably be reflected in the prize winners today. So thank you very much for giving us an insight into the work of the jury this year. The jury not only includes Sarah Nahama, but also Joel Obermeyer, Hank Obermeyer, for the, on behalf of the Obermeyer family, Christina Finch, Anita Kahane, Hanno Löwy, Frank Mecklenburg, pa Patrick Siegler and Ralf Wieland. And before we will now um, move on to the presentation of the awards, we would like to introduce to you the Widen the Circle initiatives and their work um, with this short film. Widen the Circle started with this award ceremony that my father started in Berlin that's been going on for 20 years that honors Germans who have done profound work to preserve pieces of Jewish history and culture in Germany. Many of these same awardees have done very, very profound things to fight prejudice or to reconcile with a history that allowed prejudice to grow or to make connections in the world that you would just not expect. Our awardees are amazing. And if you hear their stories, you cannot help but have some hope. I think about the Yellow Brick Wall Project at an elementary school in Berlin. It teaches children about the Holocaust and the importance of preventing hate. The project is so inspiring that it influenced the construction of a memorial to the victims of lynching in Montgomery, Alabama. Or there's a man from southern Germany who spent 40 years in his hometown researching the history of the local Jewish community. Each year, through his efforts, dozens of Jews from around the world come to town to locate their family roots. In addition to seeing where their relatives lived and worked, they get an acknowledgement of how their relatives suffered that is very powerful. Or a teacher whose students are mostly from difficult immigrant backgrounds. She found that empathy for their suffering is the first step in helping them understand the suffering of others. They maintain a Holocaust memorial at a train tracks near their school, a place where thousands of Jews were sent to death camps. And instead of thinking of it as just an award ceremony, you can think of it in a different way, which is it's kind of a platform. This shouldn't just be about an award, it should be about impact. And that's what became Widen the Circle. So we thought, okay, if we're gonna have an impact, uh, we have all these awardees, they have all this knowledge, maybe we should try and start a network. And that was the beginning of what became the forum, that we building a network that we never had before, both in terms of network of people doing the work, but also a network of what I'll call like visiting experts who are really good at what they do and feel moved by what we're doing. We started this in Germany because that's where our foundation is, that's where our history is. But we can see how the same activities can be valuable elsewhere. And so now we're beginning both think and do things in the United States where we can experiment and begin to understand what's gonna work there. And we know that these issues are relevant in both places. There's a tide of hate out there 
And what we know is we have a way of having an impact on it, which is by identifying people who are on the ground level are doing effective things to push back against this tide. We bring ingredients. We bring our own expertise, we bring our network, we bring the ability to recognize people and to tell their stories and to inspire in order to push back against this tide of hate, to expand what they can do, but also extend it so that other people can do it elsewhere in the world. Widen the Circle finds and recognizes extraordinary work happening in unexpected places, primarily that relates to issues of prejudice and a shared understanding of the past. We are doing this because it's desperately needed. We're doing this because we have a two-decade history of involvement in these issues. We're doing this because we've developed the capabilities and network and team to have a broad impact. And it's time for us to step up this kind of challenge. Our goal is to widen the circle of respect, understanding, and reconciliation. So that was quite an interesting insight into the work um, by the Obermeyer Foundation and especially widened the circle. Joel Obermeyer, you just saw him in the film. He is the director of Widen the Circle organization, which organizes the award presentation and is here today on behalf of the foundation. Great to have you I here. I am so happy to be here. <laughs> I can't even tell you how happy I am. <laughs> so we just uh, got in... Yeah, impression of your beautiful and uh, really important work, but, but how does it come an US-American family is so engaged in terms of German issues? Um, well, you know, in Judaism, there's a concept called tikkun olam, which literally means repairing the world. Uh, and in my family, we have a way of thinking about it which is that each person has their own skills and abilities and their own situation and their own unique way of, of making an impact. Um, and it just so happens that we were blessed that my father started this award ceremony and we've seen ways to build impact from it. And so we felt a responsibility just to do it. And we just saw that networking is an important part actually of your work. As we know, through the pandemic, that became a bit difficult. So how did you get through the pandemic so far? Well, you know, like everybody else, we've had to learn how to do everything virtually um, in all sorts of different ways. Uh, we have one big advantage, which is that I have a team of people we work with in the U.S. and in Germany. And so we already had to do some of these things. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, we had to figure out how to do online events. Uh, we had to think about how to do an online ceremony like this one. That's true. And, you know, we're just trying to figure it out like everyone else. Yeah. Can you tell us about uh, some current projects in terms of Widen the Circle and Obamaya Foundation? What are you doing right now? What are you planning in the near future? Um, well, um, so in the last couple of years, we've made real strides in building a network here in Germany, primarily of people who work on preserving Jewish history, remembrance, and fighting prejudice. And we've had online events and, and um, in-person events, less in person now. But, um, you know, we built this growing network uh, that really has uh, started to take off. And then the other thing that we've been doing is been thinking much more about how to build bridges between people, the United States and Germany, who deal with issues of systemic, or, uh, systemic injustice and issues around prejudice. Mm -hmm. um, we've done some virtual events, and we hope, we hope, then in June, we'll be able to bring a group of Americans here to Germany uh, to focus on these issues. And we'll be bringing a number of leaders who focus on issues of white supremacy and slavery, how to deal with those in the United States. Uh, we'll also be bringing a range of people with other kinds of expertise. So for example, um, one of the people, persons, one, one of the women who's coming is an author who is one of the US's leading experts on using um, young people's diaries to help make history and then current time issues uh, really meaningful to um, people of all sorts. It's an important work. It's somehow a beautiful work, but how do you feel about personally? How, what does it give it to you personally, Joel, this kind of work? Uh, you know, um, I started uh, getting involved in this work, um, you know, partly because it started with my father, but What, what happened is I started coming to Berlin for the awards, and I began to meet people doing this kind of work, this amazing work. 
And you can't meet people and see what they're doing uh, and not understand their kind of dedication, their motivation, the kind of challenges they have to get past, and, and begin to think you, you want to help them. Um, and I would just say that um, for me, helping to spread the impact of what they do has become uh, kind of a calling. It's come, kind of been my life's mission now. Thanks for being with us, Joel Obermeyer. Thank you. Enjoy Berlin. Vielen Dank an Joel Obermeyer. Thanks to Joel Obermeyer, and once again, um, my respect for this commitment and for the work they do. So, ladies and gentlemen, let us now proceed to the awards presentation. My colleague, journalist Tobel Axelrod, had the chance to talk to each and every one of the awardees. She is uh, working with the award winner projects over the past years and she will explain what um, why every project um, won the award Toby came to Germany on a Fulbright scholarship to Germany in 1992 to do research on how Germans are coming to terms with uh, the history of the Holocaust uh, from a perpetrator's point of view and the Obermeyer Foundation asked her to write articles on the prize winners and you will be able to find those articles on the website of the foundation. So, Toby, let us now begin. A Nobemeyer Award will go to the Puppet Theater Bobbles and the creator Shlumi Trip. Why did the jury choose her? Shelley, thank you. Thank you, Shelley. Well, Bobbles is a miracle for me in Germany. It's an outstanding project. A Jewish puppet theater named Bubbles, which celebrates the joy of life that is prevalent in Jewish culture and is intended to teach a German audience about this. It teaches about Jewish holidays and aims to share it with others, this knowledge. It is highly inclusive, it is colorful, it is lively, and that's exactly what we need right now, a spark of joy. Now, the jury members were delighted about the fact that the project creates empathy to fight against prejudice, helps mend relationships between children and parents, and generally to contribute to the culture in Germany. The Jewish culture is added to the mix of cultures in Germany. Now, what? there can't be any other better way to fight against racism and prejudice and anti-Semitism. Now, I've known Shlomo Tripp's work for years, and I actually uh, took part in a workshop uh, offered by her, which she regular, regularly conduct, conducts to build stage props. And it was delightful to see the spark in the eyes of the children as they watch the spectacle, that was more than enough for me to compensate for the uh, suffering of the current pandemic, the, the isolation. Yes, exactly, I agree. I'm also stunned by the project, and I'm delighted about this project as well, and that she is an awardee this year. But now we'll show a clip about her work. Ich bin Schlumit Tripp, bin Puppenspielerin und sitze hier gerade in meinem Bubbles Studio, wo alle Bubbles Puppen zur Welt gebracht werden. Buba heißt auf Hebräisch Puppe und Bubbele auf Jiddisch heißt so etwas wie mein kleiner Liebling. Äh, bevor ich die Bubbeles gegründet habe, hatte ich äh, mal ein Schlüsselerlebnis im Jüdischen Museum. Da hatte ich diese Grundschulklasse und es waren wirklich sehr junge Kinder, also vielleicht erste Klasse. Ja? Und ich habe die gefragt, was fällt euch zu Jüdisch ein, was kennt ihr Jüdisches? Und dann hat wirklich so ein sechsjähriger Junge gesagt, ah Juden, das sind die, die sind alle umgebracht worden, die sind alle umgebracht worden, da gab es einen Mann, der hat die nicht gemocht und der hat die alle umgebracht. Punkt. 
Und ich dachte, wenn ein sechsjähriges deutsches Kind als erstes in seinen ersten Jahren über Judentum so etwas erfährt, wie kann man denn da ein normales deutsch-jüdisches Verhältnis aufbauen? Und da war für mich irgendwie der Punkt, alles klar, ich muss etwas machen, ich muss etwas machen, dass Kinder in ihrem Erstkontakt mit dem Judentum nicht, eben gerade nicht mit der Shoah erstmal anfangen. Shoah spielt in der Hinsicht bei den Bubbles eine Rolle, dass es eben keine Rolle spielen sollte, weil beim Erstkontakt mit dem Judentum ist es einfach super wichtig, dass die Kinder erst mal eine lustige Kultur, eine lebensbejahende Kultur kennenlernen. Einfach eine normale Kultur eigentlich wie jeder andere. Und je mehr man eben auch darüber weiß, desto mehr sorgt man doch dafür, dass eben so etwas nie wieder passiert. Ich habe natürlich ähm, praktisch diese Interkulturalität in meine Wiege gelegt bekommen. Und tatsächlich habe ich mich manchmal gefragt, ob es das ist, das ist, was Hashem von mir will, dass ich eben diese Interkulturalität mit den Puppen, also in das Publikum hinausstrahle. She has been working um, to build bridges for as long as I've known her. Um, she's always worked in intercultural projects. Um, she also has a background that just makes her uniquely able to reach people because she speaks a, a few languages and she's just had a lot of exposure over her life with her specific biography to different cultures. And that's just provided her with the tools to really approach people with like a uh, kind of radical openness. Happy Hanukkah, Shlomo! Na Aisha, da habt ihr mich aber ganz schön gut reingelegt. Eine Hanukkah Lampe aus der Türkei. <lacht> Dabei gibt es doch in der Türkei gar keine Juden. Aber mein Opa hat mir gesagt, dass es in der Türkei Juden gibt. Die kamen mal aus Spanien und sprechen so etwas ähnliches wie Spanisch. Latino nennt man das. Echt? Ob die Juden in der Türkei auch Hanukkah feiern? Hm, kann schon sein. Ich muss jetzt aber los, Schlomo. Ich habe gleich Korankurs. Ach, das kenne ich. Ich habe morgen Torakurs. Echt? Und macht dir das Spaß? Manchmal ja, manchmal nein. Olan, das ist ja wie bei uns. <lacht> ich denke, was immer für alle Kinder ein interessantes Thema ist, ist natürlich Freundschaft. Ja? Und in unserem Puppentheater gibt es diese zwei Hauptpuppen. Und das ist Schlomo, der jüdische junge Schlomo und seine muslimisch-türkische Klassenkameradin Aisha. Und Aisha und Schlomo sind beste Freunde. Und wenn türkische Kinder zum Beispiel oder auch muslimische Kinder zu uns ins äh, Theater kommen, ist es immer sehr schön zu beobachten, wie sie reagieren, wenn Aisha plötzlich auftritt. Also damit rechnen die Kinder nicht. Ne? Die kommen wahrscheinlich und sagen, was soll ich denn jetzt in so einem jüdischen Puppentheater? Und wenn sie dann aber Aisha sehen, dann sagen sie, hups, Moment mal, was ist das denn? Ja, eine, eine muslimische Puppe hier im jüdischen Puppentheater und dann geht das, also der Spiel Funke sprüht dann. Also, ich finde Hanukka ganz schön lustig. Diese neuen Kerzen, die leckeren Latkes und das Spiel mit dem Dreidel. Man muss sagen, das ganze Projekt würde ja nicht funktionieren, wenn äh, nicht in, verteilt über die ganze Bundesrepublik ja, Menschen existieren würden, die teilweise sogar äh, ehrenamtlich in ihrer Freizeit sich darum kümmern, dass überhaupt die Bubbles an diese Orte fahren. Es ist im Grunde genommen für mich äh, rührend auch festzustellen, wie viele Menschen in Deutschland, in den kleinsten Ortschaften, ja, sich äh, um diesen interreligiösen oder interkulturellen Dialog auch kümmern. Und äh, deshalb ist es gerade für die ländliche Gegend, wo meine Schülerinnen und Schüler immer wieder sagen, so, es war im Synagogenbesuch meine erste Begegnung mit einer 
jüdischen Person, dass das eigentlich nicht mehr hier so sein darf. Und deshalb in dieser Region ist es ein absolutes Highlight, wenn Schlo mitkommt und uns in ihre Welt entführt und wir dann ein Teil dieser Welt auch sind durch ihre interaktiven Elemente. Und diese Menschen, die uns ermutigen, die benötigen wir, glaube ich. Weil manchmal muss man eben so ein bisschen angestoßen werden, auch um sich zu begegnen, um, um gewisse Schwellen auch zu überschreiten. Da muss man auch ein bisschen angeschubst werden, wenn man so möchte. Und da braucht man Menschen, die einen auch dazu ermutigen. Und sie ist jemand, der eben uns ermutigt, sich zu begegnen. Bubbles ist im Endeffekt auch eine Begegnung mit mir, dem Kulturchameleon, das sich hinter der Bühne versteckt und später dann nach vorne kommt und mit dem Publikum sich auch viel Zeit nimmt, mit dem Publikum dann nach der Vorstellung zu interagieren, mit den Puppen und mit den Menschen zu sprechen und eben dann auch manchmal in ihrer Landessprache, mal in Türkisch, mal in Russisch. Und wenn ich meine Bühne wieder abbaue, bin ich voller Endorphine, weil ich diese glücklichen Gesichter gesehen habe und das ist, und das ist dann egal, welche Nationalität, welche Kultur. Ähm, ich bin einfach nur froh, wenn die Leute glücklich sind. <lacht> ja, herzlichen Glückwunsch. Congratulations to Bubbles and its artistic director Schlomit Tripp on winning the Obermeier Award this year. Mazel Tov, Schlomit. Thank you. Schlomit, we just watched a film which gave us a glimpse into your wonderful work. Why do people have such a strong reaction, such an emotional reaction to puppet theater? Well, puppets and puppet theater are a wonderful didactic medium. And this is confirmed or borne out by the experience by educators in Israel and teachers in Israel. There is a center for uh, building puppets in Israel. Puppets have some kind of magic about them because they represent human beings. They are an image of human beings, an idealization of human beings, even though they are pure imagination, they refer back to human life and human experience. And of course, they also are a screen on which people can project their ideals, their fantasies, and of course, puppets are funny. They are cute. Yes, quite so. We also saw Gershom Trip uh, at your side. Now, here's the certificate that uh, goes with the award. We will send it to you. Now, your work is very moving. Where do you get your inspiration from for the stories that you act out? Well, when I was a child, people always said that I had a very vivid imagination. But the best ideas come from when, I, when I'm together with my uh, partner, Gershom Tripp, and when we just give free rein to our imagination. And he's basically an all-rounder. He is the technician. He also helps building the puppets, so he actually makes a significant contribution to this work. And we get the best ideas just when we, when we talk about what we want to do. And of course, I also find intercultural work in general very inspiring. Yeah, yes, your work is called Jewish and Intercultural Puppet Theater. What are the models for your personalities of your puppets? Well, actually, I, I can't go through all my friends and family. And uh, even if I did, I'm not sure they would talk to me afterwards. But yes, let me put it that way. Yes, there are models to the puppets that I, uh, that I build. Well, your work, your theater, is basically shows everyday life and is very vibrant, and that is something that is close to your heart. Do you think that we in Germany are well on track 
to achieving this as well. Well, I think on an educational level and an artistic level, uh, in terms of teaching people about Jewish life, a lot has changed in Germany uh, in, in the last years. And that is down to the fact that in Germany there is some kind of Jewish renaissance going on. Being Jewish in Germany no longer means only having memorial sites and cemeteries that you can visit. That is important, of course, but that's not everything. We need a vibrant Jewish culture, Jewish kindergartens, schools, football clubs, etc. Jewish life is alive and kicking in Germany. And uh, this is basically uh, a very inspiring environment for Jewish uh, puppet theater. Now, you are constantly on the move. You always have your theater with you. And that is great, of course. But do you actually wish you had a dedicated spot for your theater, maybe in, even in Berlin, where you, are, where you live? Yes, absolutely. That would be great. And it would also suit the image of Berlin. I think a city like Berlin not only needs a puppet theater, but also an intercultural puppet theater with a colorful and very diverse program. That would be wonderful. And I think Berlin should actually have such a puppet theater. Well, fingers crossed. And uh, I hope you don't mind that I call you by your first name, Schlomit. I've known you for many years. So congratulations again on winning the award this year and all the best to you. Thank you so much. Now let's move on to the next awardee, the Association Bürgerfirst Badehaus Waldram Fürenwald has also won this year. Now what is so special about this project? Well, the Badehaus project is made up of dedicated, committed citizens who wanted to avoid or wanted to work towards uh, preserving a site that is important to Jewish uh, history in Germany and Jewish life in Germany, which was uh, slated for demolition. Uh, it is a, a um, camp for displaced persons, or it used to be a camp for displaced persons. And when I met some of the people who work in, as, as part of this project, I was amazed by their focus on the care they had for the survivors of the concentration camps. There are so many people uh, in the world still that can witness um, about the vibrant life that used to take place there. And the spirit, the team, the, the spirit that was prevalent there after uh, people were liberated from the concentration camps there. Now this association works to preserve the memory of these people and teach people about it, and just to keep their memory alive. And that is, of course, very relevant in our times. Now let's look. Uh, um, let's watch a little clip about the work of this project. Wir in Waldram, dem früheren Fürnwald, haben einen historischen Schatz. Dieser Ort ist 1939-40 als Föhrenwald gegründet worden für die Rüstungsarbeiter. Hier lebten deutsche Dienstverpflichtete und auch Zwangsarbeiter und Zwangsarbeiterinnen. Dann kam gegen Kriegsende der Todesmarsch der Dachauer KZ-Häftlinge hier vorbei und wer befreit wurde hier in der Gegend, hat hier seine ersten Stunden und Tage in Freiheit verbracht. Und dann kamen nicht jüdische und jüdische Displaced Persons hierher, also Holocaust-Überlebende. Also eine irre Geschichte auf kleinstem Raum wie in einem Zeitraffer. Das Badehaus sollte vor über zehn Jahren abgerissen werden und da hat sich eine Bürgerinitiative formiert und wir haben um diesen Platz hier gekämpft und um das Badehaus und äh, so ist es losgegangen. 
Wir sind in der Zwischenzeit mehr als 540 Mitglieder, vom Schüler bis zur Dozentin, vom Handwerker bis zum Rentner. Also haben wir hier alles äh, vertreten und jeder bringt halt so seine äh, Talente und Fähigkeiten hier ein. It's a completely voluntary association and without this voluntary engagement of many people, above all Sibylle Kraft, who with their own hands actually built, rebuilt the Bader House and made this happen, it's just unbelievable. Wir sind keine Gedenkstätte im klassischen Sinn. Wir nennen uns auch Erinnerungsort. Everybody learns in school in Germany and many other places about Auschwitz and Dachau and concentration camps. But what happened to the survivors? Where were they? Uh, and that's what the Badehaus tells us. That's what the story of Föhrenwald tells us. At the end of the war, thousands of Holocaust survivors, Jews from various countries, gradually gathered in the camp. From 1946, to 1948, varied educational, cultural, social, and sportive activities flourished in Fernwald. In addition, so many Holocaust survivors married in the camp. I myself was born in Fernwald on January 1947. I associate Fernwald with a wonderful childhood. I was born in Fehrenwald. I left there when I was three and a half years old. And there were many, many pictures of me, okay, going from birth all the way to age three and a half. I think there should be one place that teaches that even though you go through the most horrendous thing in the world, you can, when you survive, you can step forward. You can take that next step. You can be brave. You can make that decision to go on with your life. And I think that's the story that the Badhaus tells. This initiative, the Badhaus, really put this past on the map again. So what Badehaus did is to not just restore the memory of this place, but also give a voice to the people who lived there, who were born there, who grew up there, it really puts it into context of the complex German history of the 20th century. Allein die Geschichte des Displaced Persons, die wird, glaube ich, noch in keinem Museum so erzählt wie bei uns. Und dann gerade die einmalige Verbindung zwischen der erzwungenen Migration der Zwangsarbeiter und der Heimatvertriebenen, die sich so an einem Ort einmalig ähm, verdichtet, macht den Ort prädestiniert dafür, diese Nachkriegsgeschichte herauszustreichen. Und deswegen steht der Ort auch so in der Übererzählung der Migration bis heute. Mit dem Erinnerungsort Badehaus geht es uns nicht nur darum, den Blick zurück in die Vergangenheit zu richten, sondern eben auch eine Sensibilität an Wachsamkeit zu erzeugen für das, was heute passiert, an antisemitischen, rechtsradikalen Strömungen, fremdenfeindlichen Strömungen. Das ist etwas ganz Zentrales und da haben wir immer auch Veranstaltungen, die wir einbauen, Ausstellungen, Filme, Vorträge. Das gehört sozusagen zur DNA unseres Erinnerungsprojektes dazu, dass wir vor den heutigen Problemen die Augen nicht verschließen. I just find it extraordinary that a group of people would take their time and their energy to create this museum, that they would create in effect a community that is far larger than just the four walls of this museum. The reverberations and the repercussions of their actions are spilling out all over the world. Ja, ein Obermeier Award geht also in so congratulations Jahr. on winning an Obermeier Award this year. Congratulations to the Burger for Bader House. This is your certificate. And I would like to welcome Dr. Sibylle Kraft and 
Jonathan Conan, who work in the association, who are members of the board. And as far as I can see, they have other members of the association with them at the actual uh, Bader House. Congratulations. Now, who are the people who come to find out more about this place and its history? Yes, hello from Bavaria, from Bader House. Quite so. We are here at the Bader House. This is our core team who has contributed to making this place such a wonderful uh, memorial site, such a wonderful museum. Here on the walls you can see the contemporary witnesses, their names, their photographs. And of course, first of all, I would like to thank you warmly for the award. Thank you so much. We feel honored. Now, uh, as far as your question is concerned, well, we welcome all sorts of people from far and near, young and old, contemporary witnesses as well, especially from the US and from Israel, and of course their family, their children and grandchildren who just want to find out about their family history, about the story is the history of their parents and grandparents. Um, and about the place where they started their life all over again after the Shoah. Can you tell us about what impact your work has made on the site and on the surroundings? Well, I have to say, before I came here, I had never talked to a contemporary witness personally. And here, when we opened the museum, we had 60 contemporary witnesses from all over the world who attended the opening, and it was such a humbling experience to find out about their stories, to talk to them, to hear the stories of their parents and grandparents. And uh, you could see some of the contemporary witnesses in the, in the film. You can see that many of them are young because they are also their children and grandchildren who uh, are involved in this project. So we can actually talk to them personally. Now, what has changed in terms of uh, our outlook? Well, we tell the story, the post-war story, of the people who survived the Holocaust. Where did they go? What became of them? And what has become of them? This is a story that is not often told. Well, you are all volunteers, and uh, you involve people of all ages. And this is wonderful, of course, to see so many young people getting involved in your project and lend a helping hand to your project. Everybody contributes their own skills. Now, what is the motivation? What motivates the people to get involved and to contribute? Well, first of all, I think it's the, the issue that we are that we are dealing with. We are telling the stories of people, of real people, and we are preserving their memory for future generations. That is the prime motivation that we have. And of course, it is our team, a wonderful team, a wonderful community. There are three generations working in our team. You can see Jonathan is the youngest. He's my deputy. He's 24 years old. And the oldest member of our team is Maria, who is 80 years old. And there is a contemporary witness who lives here as well, who is also involved in our work. So you can see people from all walks of life, Elisabeth, Manuel, Justina, they all contribute their own very individual skills and when people have difficulties or when our association experiences or meets obstacles, we just help each other. We stand by each other 
It's great to see such a spirit of support and collaboration, but of course our prime motivation is to tell the stories of the contemporary witnesses. I would just like to add something. Tikkun Olam, uh, Joel Obermeyer mentioned it before. We are totally committed to this idea. We are trying to make a contribution to Tikkun Olam. So it is wonderful to see that so many of you have made this project your home, that you have constructed such a wonderful place that brings together so many people. Just one brief question to conclude. Is it true that you don't receive any public funds? Any public funding? Unfortunately, this is true. We do not receive any funding from the authorities or from the government. This is a big problem for us. We are currently trying to keep the project afloat by um, launching individual projects and finding donors. And of course, it would be impossible to do all this work without the voluntary commitment of uh, all these people. There are tens of thousands of hours of work that have been contributed to make this project happen and come to fruition. And I just hope that politicians will become aware of our project and will support us in the future. Yes, because you also support democracy. So I respect your work. I appreciate it. All the best for your future. And congratulations again. And thank you for being here on the screen, at least. Uh, it's wonderful to see so many of you. And of course, we'll send the certificate to you. Let's move on. We'll have some music now at the House of Representatives here in Berlin. I'm delighted to welcome the um, pianist Samu Huda and the double bass player Gal Golob, who are students at the Jazz Institute, uh, which is part of the Hans Eisler uh, College of Music. Chamesh Ezra is the title of their piece.
Ja, jetzt gäbe es eigentlich einen tobenden Applaus. Well, normally would you would have applause now here at this house. We will see the two of them again later. So now let us move on to the next award, which will go to Christoph, P Christoph Peace and the Association Friends of the Laufsweiler Synagogue. T um, Toby why did you choose this project? Uh, the prize winner was born only a few years after the end of the war in Rhineland Palatinate, and like many of his generation, he tried to ask his parents about their experiences in the war, and he didn't get the right answers. Some of the things that really impressed me about Mr. Peace was that he didn't give up. For decades, he's been working with colleagues, friends and neighbors, and with children, the children of the school he um, taught as, as a teacher uh, to make sure that the story of the rural Jews would not be forgotten. He made a difference in the region. He reached the descendants um, abroad of the Jews, the local Jews, and um, tried to get them in touch with descendants in Israel, for instance. The jury and I were impressed with this project, uh, which is carried out in a rural area, and the jury thought that the commitment of M Mr. Peace has the potential to um, make a great impact. He also tried and managed to establish a contact with migrants who moved to Germany recently. One of his pupils told me that she and her friends earlier thought that the older generation's job was to take care of remembrance, but at some point we need to take over, she said, and Mr. Pease showed them how to do it. Thank you, um, Toby, for the explanation and now you'll see another clip. Mein Name ist Christoph Pies und das Interesse für jüdische Geschichte kam eigentlich erst als junger Lehrer macht man sich ja unbeliebt und beschäftigt sich mit der jüdischen Geschichte des Schulortes. Das haben wir schon um 1980, da war ich gerade ein paar Jahre im Dienst gemacht. So, und dann haben wir etwas recherchiert und kamen dann eben auf viele Namen in der ganzen Welt. Und ein Herr aus Israel, Hans Simon Forst, mit dem wir dann später befreundet waren, der hat uns dann einen langen Brief geschrieben. Und da standen die Fakten drin. So ist das Interesse gewachsen, dass ich mich mit Schülern immer um dieses Thema gekümmert habe. My father and my mother really appreciated what Mr. Peace is doing. He took it as his life mission, not to forget and to learn and to understand. And this is after decades that nobody talked about it. Und hier in Lauferswalder kam es dann in den 80er Jahren zu einer großen Diskussion im Gemeinderat, was machen wir mit dieser Synagoge. Ist dann unter Denkmalschutz gestellt worden, ist dann 86, 87 renoviert worden und dann bei der Wiedereröffnung haben wir dann äh, Nachkommen eingeladen, die dann hier äh, gesprochen haben. Also das waren dann diese Familien, die dann auch hier hinkamen. Sie waren mit den Kastlanern Forst verwandt und die Familie Meyer hier aus Lauferswalder. Und deshalb haben wir das Studienzentrum dann vor sieben Jahren Forst Meyer Studienzentrum für das Landjudentum genannt. Also das setzt sich fort und das ist eben aus den damals beginnenden Recherchen erwachsen. Each and every one of us express his thanks to the association, um, to the study center, uh, to Mr. Peace for bringing it all together, for keeping the memory of the congregation. And I think that every time that a student come into the Faust Meyer study center, my father and mother are smiling up in heaven. Meine Arbeit hat ja hier begonnen eigentlich mit dem Aufbau des Studienzentrums und zunächst mal mit dem Aufbau der Bibliothek. 
Und darüber bin ich dann auch immer mehr in die Begegnung mit den Schulklassen eingestiegen. Und das ist jetzt eigentlich das, was meine, meine Hauptaufgabe ausmacht. Also die Begegnung mit den Schulklassen, die ich dann versuche, in diesen Ort einzuführen, in die Geschichte dieses Ortes einzuführen, sie mit den Schicksalen ähm, auch vertraut zu machen. Ja, in eine Diskussion zu kommen und ein offenes ähm, Gespräch zu kommen, in dem die Schüler nicht mit gewissen Erwartungen, mit welchen Gefühlen oder welchen Erkenntnissen sie dann hier rausgehen, ähm, konfrontiert sind, sondern dass man ähm, gemeinsam eigentlich diese Geschichte entdecken kann und dann sehen kann, was das mit einem macht. Wenn Schüler alleine hier die Ausstellung sich ansehen und dann Fragen stellen zu einem 13-, 14-Jährigen, der hier nebenan gewohnt hat, der ist dann alleine von seiner Mutter als 13-Jähriger nach Luxemburg geschickt worden, weil sie meinte, er sei doch sicher. So, und er hat dann die Reispogromnacht noch hier neben der Synagoge erlebt und hat dann, als er in Luxemburg war, einen Bericht als 13-Jähriger geschrieben. Wenn Schüler das lesen, dann merken sie sofort, wo es hinführt, wenn eine Gesellschaft sich so verhält und solchen Rattenfängern hinterherläuft. Sie merken sofort, das ist ein, ein menschliches Problem, das ist genau damals äh, so wie heute auch. Wir haben eine Exkursion gemacht mit Geflüchteten, die hier in der Region aufgenommen wurden. Und äh, wir sind mit einer Gruppe nach Weimar gefahren zum Beispiel. Wir haben die Stadt Weimar entdeckt, deutsche Kultur natürlich, aber waren auch mit ihnen zusammen im Konzentrationslager in Buchenwald. Also Buchenwald deshalb, weil der Paul Schneider, der hier aus einem Nachbarort, äh, der war da zuletzt äh, Pastor, und ist ja dann äh, im Juli 1939 mit einer Giftspritze ermordet worden. Und äh, wir standen vor dieser Zelle Paul Schneiders und einer der Jugendlichen hat begonnen, äh, von seiner Flucht aus Syrien zu erzählen und hat dort äh, diese Geschichte zum Anlass genommen, eigentlich ja, zum ersten Mal äh, seine eigene Geschichte zu reflektieren und zu teilen. Und das war für uns alle ein wahnsinnig besonderer Moment. Und da sieht man eben, warum man das macht. Ja, dass, dass die Dinge, die einem Paul Schneider oder anderen passiert sind, ihm heute genauso passieren. Da war, da war der, der uns da geführt hat in Buchenwald, der wusste auch, genau wie ich jetzt, nichts zu sagen. Äh, der steht er da vor der Zelle und erzählt von seiner Gefangenschaft, wie er gefoltert wurde. Äh, wir alle haben da so gestanden. Die Geschichte wiederholt sich nicht. Der Mensch bleibt gleich. Und der Mensch, das sehen wir hier in der Ausstellung, hat die Entscheidung, gut oder böse zu sein. Er kann sich mit den Nazis zusammenrotten. Er kann aber auch dagegen opponieren. Und das ist das Wichtigste, was wir heute tun, diese Zivilcourage den Jugendlichen äh, beizubringen, das ist das Wichtigste. Dass sie aufstehen gegen menschenverachtende Ideologien. So, a 2022 Obermeier Award goes to Christoph Pies and the Association Friends of the Lausweiler Synagogue. Congratulations, Christoph Pies and Carolyn Manz. Can you hear us? Yes, thank you. Uh, wonderful to have you. Uh, we can see in the background that you are sitting in the study center that we just saw in the clip, uh, a center where you receive so many people and tell them about the stories and the history of your, of your town. What do, do you gain personally from the work you do? Well, actually, it's not really about us, but about our society, about our students, our pupils. This is what's important to me. If I just thought of myself, of course, it did broaden my horizon immensely to learn more about the Jewish history of our, of our town, making new friends across the world, clearly. But as a teacher, 
and being able to having worked with um, people who have the same convictions for 30 years now. This is, of course, enri enriching, but it's the same as with the project we just heard about. We do not gain and get receive funding, so it's always a, a bit difficult for us to see how we will make it next year and the year after. But what is my mission is to pass down my um, what what I do to to the next generation. Carolyn, what do you gain from this educational work? Well, there are always moments when you realize that something is changing with you and with the students. Sometimes you they take things for granted when you study the Holocaust, but then at a certain point you find a certain report or you find pictures that make you question um, what you what you thought was evident. And then you have those. Then, it, then of course, it's very moving to initiate these kinds of experiences with others, and it's something very special. I'd like to take a closer look at those moments. We've seen what happened to this Syrian young man when he went and visited to the Buchenwald concentration camp and talked about his um, his personal story for the first time. A very moving moment for everybody. I guess. So these stories give rise to universal questions, don't they? This is part of your mission, isn't it? So where is the spark for young people to look into these stories, this history? Where is it where you feel you can make a difference, Christoph? Well, as opposed to, just like Schlomit said, we do not start with the Shoah, especially primary primary school pupils. Uh, we, we give them um, we give them sweets and to break the ice and ask them what what are what is your motivation. Um, some people say it's just like going to church. They don't really see a difference there when you're when they're very young. But if they're older, they might already have prejudices, and um, you have to take a different approach. So we try to take a very uncomplicated approach when it comes to Jewish life. We have two concentration camps in our region that are now memorials. We want to focus on Jewish life and not just death and, and the past. Of course it plays a role at a certain point, but what we want to do is to teach about Jewish life. The, the man who, um, the Syrian man who was with us there uh, uh, played a role, but but what really, really is important that often amongst children, religion doesn't really play a role. And this is what we want to preserve and teach them about. So, as I said, with older children, they have a certain worldview already. They have certain opinions, certain ideas. Sometimes we have lectures from um, from from the armed forces or, or people from companies who come here to listen in. So they're very different target groups. I imagine we would like to give thanks to your long-standing commitment and wish you all the best for the future. Christoph Peace and Carolyn Manns, congratulations on the award this year. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, we don't see just the two of us as winners, but the many volunteers who contribute. Um, 
somebody mentioned earlier ordinary people from from the town here they don't have a research background and for them this prize is very important indeed uh, thank you very much Christoph and greetings to all of the people involved in your association so now let us move on to the next award it goes to another association which is called type house in Dublin in Saxony so Toby tell us what did the jury like particularly about this project so type house is a place in Dublin where good things are nurtured it was created in 1997 by young people who were fed up by being harassed by a right bring populists and extremists even today, it offers young people a safe space to come together. But in 25 years, many things have changed. Today, it's also a place where you can learn about the local history during the Nazis, a part of our history that was hidden and concealed for years. I was impressed by the diversity of people who turn to Type House, people who seek refuge, shelter for themselves, for their children, and of course people who want to learn more about the history during the Nazis. Amongst the nominators was one Jewish family in Amsterdam who, thanks to Tripe House and other local history centers, learned more about the story of their grandfather a businessman who fled during the, under the Nazis. The jury and I were also impressed by the way how, how Tripe House translates the lessons learned from the Shoah to the present time and brings together people from different backgrounds, including refugees. As one of the jury members told me, Tribe House is full of people who address social problems directly and say, I want to change this, I want to make a difference. So let's take a closer look at the work of Tribe House in this clip. Treibhaus ist erstmal ein anderer Begriff für Gewächshaus. Also wir sind ein Schutzraum, wo Sachen sprießen können. Treibhaus ist 1997 gegründet worden, da war ich zwölf Jahre alt. Und man muss dazu sagen, in den 90ern bis zu den frühen 2000ern gab es ja auch die sogenannten Baseballschlägerjahre. Das heißt, regelmäßig sind eben auch Nazi-Skinheads in Jugendclubs, in Kneipen gegangen und haben Leute gesucht, die nicht gepasst haben, um dann eben den auf die Schnauze zu hauen, auf gut Deutsch. Und der Ursprung des Treibhauses sozusagen einen Schutzraum zu gründen, wo man Hip-Hopper sein konnte, Punk oder Krufti oder was auch immer und hier eben nicht diskriminiert wird. Ja, unser Antrieb ist, das Leben in Döbeln zu bereichern durch vielfältige Angebote und deswegen haben wir ja auch so viele Projekte im Haus und bedienen so viele Arbeitsfelder, um möglichst viele Menschen zu erreichen. Unsere Kultur ist generationsübergreifend. Es lebt davon, dass Menschen zusammenkommen, ihre eigenen Interessen vertreten, niedrigschwellige Kultur erleben, auch, auch politische Bildung und gute Jugendarbeit bekommen. Und dementsprechend sprach das Haus und der Verein schon immer verschiedene Altersgruppen an und hat diese aber auch zusammengebracht. Und wir haben immer auch in meiner Zeit darauf Wert gelegt, den Jungen, auch den Jüngsten, die Chance zu geben, sich selbst einen Raum zu schaffen, sich selbst in Projekten zu entwickeln. Und wir sind sehr froh, dass der Verein jetzt über 20 Jahre Bestand hat und sich das Konzept so verfestigt hat, aber auch immer wieder verändert. Neue Projekte, neue Fördermittelgeber, neue Ideen, neue Leute, neue Zeiten. Wir hatten nicht den Masterplan seit 1997, wir wollen die ganzen Arbeitsfelder irgendwie bespielen, sondern es gab einen Mangel, jemand hatte eine Idee, also komm her, lass uns gemeinsam daran arbeiten und dann ausprobieren. Entweder das funktioniert oder es funktioniert nicht. Und ich glaube, das, das macht ein Treibhaus aus. Das macht ein soziokulturelles Zentrum aus im besten Sinne. Eben im Vergleich zur Hochkultur, wo vieles steif und träge ist, eher flexibel auf ähm, gesellschaftliche Ereignisse zu reagieren. Die AG Geschichte ist gegründet worden von meiner Kollegin Sophie und mir. Also mit der AG Geschichte haben wir die NS-Zeit Döbelns erforscht. Zum einen ist es uns wichtig zu zeigen, dass eben die Shoah, der Holocaust, nicht nur in, also der Mord ist in Auschwitz passiert zum Beispiel, aber die Ausgrenzung, das Vertreiben, die Arisierung, das ist an den ehemaligen Wohnorten passiert. Das Wissen zu bewahren, 
das ist so ein Ziel. Wir wollen diese Geschichten nicht in Vergessenheit geraten lassen und möglichst viele Leute darauf aufzuklären. Der Treibhausverein ist deswegen wichtig, weil die alle mitnehmen und weil die offen sind und weil die sich damit befassen. Also das ist ja nicht nur die Geschichte, das ist das, was mir so besonders gut gefällt, weil die einfach das Thema rüber retten, bevor es vergessen wird. Über allem steht dann das Ziel, natürlich Vorurteile abzubauen. Also durch niedrigschwellige Angebote, Begegnung schaffen, ähm, Austausch schaffen, Wissen vermitteln, ja. Also ein Grundpfeiler war schon immer die Arbeit mit Menschen mit Migrationshintergrund. Und 2015 war aber dann so eine Zeit, wo wir eher in so einer Notsituation eingesprungen sind, weil es gab zu dem Zeitpunkt halt kein festes Projekt. In Döbeln wurde damals auch eine Erstaufnahmeeinrichtung eröffnet. Und natürlich hatten wir von Anfang an Protest, aber gleichzeitig kamen eben auch ganz viele Menschen und wollten helfen. Und der treibhaus e.V. ist da eingesprungen und hat erstmal Struktur geboten, hat moderiert, hat verschiedene Prozesse begleitet und das, was daraus entstanden ist, war eben dieses Projekt Willkommen in Döbeln und gerade, dass es doch geschafft wurde, auch migrantische Selbstorganisationen mit ins Boot zu holen, wo Jamal auch ein wichtiger Vertreter war, der ansprechbar war, wenn es um Dolmetschen geht, wenn es um Fragestellungen geht, die wir selber nicht, auch nicht auf den ersten Blick verstehen konnten oder, oder lösen konnten. Treibhaus bedeutet einen Sozialverein, Sozial für die Menschen. Außerdem Sozial bedeutet auch Machtfreude. Die Leute sammeln sich hier. Du siehst verschiedene Farben, verschiedene Sprachen, verschiedene Kulturen. Diese Bruderschaft, diese Freundschaft. Ich kann nie vorstellen, dass ohne Treibhaus, das ist hier in Dobel. Ich weiß nie, aber kann ich nie vorstellen. Es gibt immer mal wieder Menschen, die ja auch so ein Statement bringen von wegen, eigentlich braucht jede Kommune, jeder kleine, große Ort irgendwie so ein Haus, so ein Verein, so, ein, so eine Wirkungsstätte, wo Leute miteinander Dinge aushandeln können. Und diese Idee, halt nicht nur einen Raum zu schaffen, wo Veranstaltungen stattfinden und Leute herkommen, die konsumieren, sondern auch immer in den Projekten und Angeboten so einen Ansatz zu haben, dass Menschen sich einbringen und Menschen auch aktiv dazu aufgefordert werden, teilzuhaben und mitzugestalten, das empfinde ich als wahnsinnig wichtig. Und das ist ja ein sehr, sehr niedrigschwelliger Ansatz, eigentlich Leuten auch Demokratie beizubringen. Ich finde es ganz wichtig zu betonen, dass wir nicht nur klar gegen Antifaschismus und Antirassismus sind, sondern dass wir für was sind. Wir sind ähm, für Humanismus, wir sind für eine offene Gesellschaft, wir sind für eine liberale Demokratie. Ähm, ja, weil man sich oft nur darüber definiert, gegen was man ist, aber man schwer formulieren kann, für was man ist. Und ähm, der Begriff, der da seit der Aufklärung rumgeistert, ähm, ist Humanität. Und ich glaube, das versuchen wir mit all unseren Projekten zu leben. The 2022 Obermeier Award goes to Tripehouse EV in Dublin in Saxony. Congratulations to you. Thank you. Now, there are quite a few of you with us online. Um, Stefan Konrad, youth worker, how, and I can already guess, has the, associa the association Tribe House changed the atmosphere in Durban? Toby mm, formulated this quite, quite appropriately. There is now a space, um, a safe space, where we can hang, so to say. This is something that I would have loved to see as a young man. But it was exciting, of course, to do the pioneering work back then. And now you've accomplished it, and it is um, it is fundamental. M many people said they can't imagine Durban without Type House. So, um, Henry Engelmann, you're the managing director, do you also face opposition and how, if so, do you manage it? Well, yes, of course, the lo local Nazi scene, um, who very much oppose, opposes us, um, they threaten us, they, um, they, it's harassment, of course, they uh, have been even attacks. Um, then, of course, the right-wing populist Alternative for Deutschland Party, who tried to um, make our lives very hard. 
if they could, they would make sure we won't receive any more funding. But there is a lot of support in the region. Many people who are actively engaged, people in Saxony who, who provide financial support, uh, prominent people, Sebastian Krubeli, who with his campaign, Rescue and Save the Clubs, uh, support us, especially now uh, during the pandemic. Um, this figure is part of the German band Die Prinzen, who has been a, a prominent opponent, a fight against um, the Nazis and right-wing populism. What makes this work so special to you, Matthias Brauneis? It's hard to tell because it's so diverse and something that we share with the other awardees today is that we are in it with all our hearts. And for me personally, this work has shaped me. I've pretty much grown up in this association, in this club. It's a place where I spent years of my childhood, of my youth. At first it was just a bar I went to, but then slowly but solemnly I really understood um, what it was all about and it gave me a different access to education beyond school and all of this in Döbeln, a small city with just 20,000 uh, inhabitants in what we often call um, Saxon backland, Saxon hinterland. Uh, of course, um, we do have problems with with Nazi movements, and it's quite astonishing that such a, an association could grow as it did over the past years. And what makes it special for me, of course, uh, are the friendships, uh, the many friends I met, the friendships that they have grown across and that across generations and and that people um, over years and years and years continue to support us and work with us. The, the, tri the, the name Treibhaus is a very good choice. It means, um, it means greenhouse, a place where things thrive. And uh, we have learned today that association like yours have a broad base of support, so I hope you all understand, understand this award as yours. Uh, thank you very much indeed for your commitment. I hope you continue and all the best for the future. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Well, the Obermeyer Awards 2022, uh, you will meet and learn more about the next awardees later, but first of all, uh, we'll hear some more music from the double bassist Gal Galob and the pianist Samu Huda.
Gal Galop, bass, and Samu Huda at the piano, live here at the Obermeyer Awards at the House of Representatives in Berlin. Now let's move on to the next awardees. Another award goes to Josef Wiskirchen. Tobi, what did the jury like about Josef Wiskirchen's work? What, according to me and the other jury members, we chose Josef Wismayer, Wiskirchen, because he conducts research on Jewish history in Romitzkirchen. He is working towards bringing the Jewish history to life in uh, the place where he lives. He draws inspiration from his neighbors and other people who work on local history. And he started his work in the 1970s. And like the other awardees that we've seen today, Josef Wiskirchen didn't know much about local Jewish history uh, when he was a young man. But then he saw a film called Nacht und Nebel about Jewish life. And this changed his outlook. It changed his life overnight. Now, Josef Wiskirchen is a strong force at a local level to keep the memory of Jewish life in his region alive. He has close ties to the uh, descendants of the local Jewish families. And uh, he made contact with students from a local school who wanted to lay one of the uh, Stolpersteine, the brass uh, cobblestones that remember the local history. And he got in touch with them and told them and shared his knowledge about him. Let's look at a movie about his work. My name is uh, Josef Wiskirchen. I was 1939, a few months before the in Bonn, geboren. 45 is my father in Russian Kriegsgefangenschaft gestorben. My mother was then 37 years old. She had six small children. I was the fourth of them. So I bin the child of a Kriegerwitwe and have insofern auch die Auswirkungen der nationalsozialistischen Barbarei am Beispiel meiner Mutter hautnah miterlebt. Schließlich ist Geschichte das Fach geworden, das mich am meisten fasziniert hat und in das ich am meisten Lebenskraft und Arbeit hineingesteckt habe. Ich bin 1966 hier in diesen Ort hineingezogen und dann 1978 hat ein kleiner Tornado das Dach der ehemaligen Synagoge abgedeckt und die Feuerwehr musste aktiv werden und fand denn unter dem Dach oben alte jüdische Gebetbücher in hebräischer Schrift. Und damals haben wir im Geschichtsverein gesagt, so unsere Aufgabe ist es, die Geschichte der Menschen, die mit diesem religiösen Gebäude verbunden sind, die aufzuarbeiten. Und haben gleichzeitig die Stadt dazu bewegt, erstens das Gebäude zu kaufen, äh, zweitens es unter Denkmalschutz zu stellen und es zu renovieren. Und während ich selbst in einer kleinen Arbeitsgruppe mich beschäftigt habe mit der Geschichte dieser jüdischen Gemeinde. Und das ist dann etwas, was mich nicht mehr losgelassen hat. Ich wusste von der Familie Herz. Ich saß im Archiv und auf einmal bekomme ich das Geburtsdatum des jüngsten Kindes und stelle fest, 1942 geboren. Das Kind war drei Jahre jünger als ich. Und dadurch wurde auf einmal das Historische, das man so gerne für das Vergangene hält, zu etwas Gegenwärtigem. Sein Elternhaus ist nicht weit hier von meinem Wohnhaus. Wenn ich morgens zum Bäcker gehe, komme ich an diesem Elternhaus vorbei. Und die letzte Begegnung mit ihm war noch vor gar nicht so langer Zeit. Und zwar hatten Schüler mit ihrem Lehrer ein Projekt gemacht über Juden in Stommeln. Und das hat zu einer Einladung an äh, Rudi Herz geführt. Und er ist dann hier in Stommeln gewesen und die Aula war voll. Waren das 200, waren das 300 eventuell, die dort gekommen sind. 
Und der Rudi Herz hat dann aus seinem Leben erzählt. Ich glaube, das war ein Höhepunkt eigentlich der Aufarbeitung der jüdischen Vergangenheit in unserem Ort. Ich hatte die Biografie über Rudi Herz geschrieben, das haben Raumerskirchener gekauft und dann kamen schließlich Raumerskirchener auf mich zu und sagten, schreib doch mal etwas hier, etwas genaueres über Raumerskirchen. When Joseph started writing to me and we exchanged information, etc., in one of his letters he tells me about the Trippins and that the Trippins hid my family in during World War II. They were literally righteous Gentiles. And when he wrote this to me, I said, oh my God, I've got to get in touch with them. I've got to thank them and tell them how grateful I am. So Joseph was able to help to make the connection for my mother to be able to get into the family home. And this was the first time my, this is 2019. Um, it's the first time my mother's walked into that home since she left it when she was six or seven years old in 1938, just before Kristallnacht. My mother walked around the home. You could just see this flood of memories come over her and this sense of gratitude and a sense of a smile and a sense of joy. And I think that's the other piece that happened is for her, this was a, journey of forgiveness and of reconciliation. Knowing Yosef has certainly changed our perspective on Germany um, and on our family roots. It has yeah, given us this connection and given me something in Germany to love instead of just like hate and fear. I think the Trippins also speak to like the power of ordinary people. And yet like he saved my family. You know, he saved a whole bunch of us. He got my great grandfather out. He like brought food to my other relatives who were in hiding. He literally hid some of my other relatives in his home. And so I think it just shows like you don't have to be anyone great or special to do a great thing. You just have to do the right thing, do the great thing. And that's how you become the kind of person who is great. <laughs> Wenn ich begreifen will, wer ich bin, dann muss ich auch wissen, wo ich herkomme. Und dazu genügt nicht der private Blick in die eigene Familie, sondern dazu gehört auch der Blick in die Vergangenheit jener Gemeinschaft, in die ich hineingeboren bin. Also ich bin hineingeboren in die deutsche Geschichte mit all ihren Lasten. Und ich glaube, um mich selbst zu begreifen, meinen Platz zu finden in der heutigen Welt, muss ich wissen, was früher gewesen ist. Alles, was wir denken, was wir handeln, die Entscheidungen, die wir treffen, werden gesteuert letzten Endes aus der Erinnerung. Josef Wiskirchen, congratulations to you on winning the Obermeier Award 2022 and welcome. Thank you. Now, You are telling all these stories. What is your personal motivation to do that? Well, I was a history teacher. And all my professional life, of course, I talked about these topics, anti-Semitism, national socialism, at school, in class. But of course the subject is very abstract if you learn about it at school. And at the outset, when I was young, I didn't know any Jews. There was no, even no descendant of the Jewish families who used to live here, who I would have been able to talk to. But things changed in 1979 when in Stommeln, where I live, I found out that there was a synagogue and that there used to be a Jewish community. I had never heard about it even though I lived there. I had lived there for 12 years. So I started to dig deeper, to delve deeper, to find out, to investigate the biographies, the stories of the families who used to live here. And I was shocked what I found out about it. And that you seem to 
still be fascinated by your work, you still go on doing your research. Are you moved by the stories that you find, that you read about? Yes, of course. There are some stories that end with someone escaping the German home and rebuilding their life in the US and become very successful afterwards. And of course, that fills me with a sense of satisfaction because it just shows that the horrible barbarism of, Nazi, of the Nazi regime wasn't successful in all cases. But unfortunately, in about 50% of the uh, stories that I've researched, ended with the uh, people being murdered. That is a terrible fate. It's always unbearable, but it's especially unbearable if, if these people are children. If I think back that there were children among those who were murdered, disabled children who didn't get a visa to travel to the US, who didn't who were, didn't manage to flee from the from Germany and who were deported to Riga in the 1940s and who lost their lives amid the upheavals of that time and their traces are just lost. I can't forget their fate and their fates should not be forgo forgotten. So you're putting a face to all these people that you research about. That is a, a very laudable aim. Now, has your work changed your outlook on life? Well, if I walk around my home town, I pass buildings where Jewish families used to live. The homes of people whose history I explored, I investigated. And every time it seems to me that the lives of these people, their, their suffering, and sometimes also their successes in the US, when, where they rebuilt their lives, comes to mind. And it made this Jewish past of the place where I live a part of my life as well. It made me very sensitive to all lies and bigotry whenever people talk about Israel and Jews. And you pass on your expertise and your knowledge, which is wonderful. And this is why you have been chosen for the Obermeyer Award. Thank you very much for your commitment and all the best to you. Thank you as well. Another Obermeyer Award goes to Zeitlupe, Stadtgeschichte and Erinnerung. That is the name of the association. Toby, why did the jury pick this awardee? Zeitlupe is a relatively new project, which is very telling. The name is very telling. Zeitlupe means slow motion. That is to say, the project wants to take a deeper look at the Shoah and Jewish history. It encourages people to take a step back and look at history and take their time doing that. It is located in Neubrandenburg and it uses authentic, or it focuses on authentic sites that were relevant to the Nazi regime in the past, camps for forced laborers, and also centers of the intelligence services of the um, communist regime under the German Democratic Republic. The audience of this project is very wide. It involves a lot of people from all walks of life, young people and old people, and it helps these people to understand history and to use it also for their contemporary problems in their personal or private or professional lives. 
One of those people working with the project told me that it's not always easy to imagine what people actually did back then with um, the excuse that they were only following orders. I was impressed by the slow approach to learning and thinking that the project encourages and the independent way of thinking. We're not only focusing on local history, but we're also discovering our moral compass to stand up for the right things in life. Yes, let's watch a little film about their work. Unser Projekt hat den schönen Namen Zeitlupe. Zeitlupe, darin steckt in der deutschen Sprache zumindest die Lupe. Das heißt, man benutzt die Lupe, um Spuren zu suchen in der Region. Es steckt aber auch drin, dass es eine Lupe auf die Zeit gerichtet ist, nämlich auf die vergangene Zeit, schwerpunktmäßig die NS-Zeit. Und es steckt noch etwas drin, was man aus dem Film kennt, wo etwas langsamer läuft. Und der pädagogische Lernprozess, der muss bei Themen wie Verfolgung, Völkermord, Holocaust, muss langsam laufen und viel Raum lassen für eigene Bewegung, eigene Aktivität und Zeit zu verarbeiten. Das Projekt KZ-Gedenkort Neubrandenburg-Waldbau, das begann im Prinzip 2018 und dann haben wir in einem Team in 14 Monaten ein Nutzungskonzept entwickelt und haben versucht, diesen Ort zugänglich zu machen. Das ist früher der Hauptweg des KZ-Außenlagers gewesen. Das war eine Zweigstelle von dem größten Frauen-KZ-Außenlager, was Regie von Ravensbrück war. Und Frauenhäftlinge, KZ-Häftlinge mussten mit wenig, mit wenig Ausrüstung hier eigentlich Produktionshallen und Baracken in die Erde eingraben. Wir haben inzwischen 1500, 1600 Namen gesammelt. Insgesamt in den beiden Lagerteilen KZ-Außenlager Neubrandenburg waren aber weit über 7000 Frauen und Mädchen. Schülerinnen und Schüler der Stadt, Bibliotheksangestellte, Angestellte aus der Stadtverwaltung, Auszubildende, alle möglichen Menschen haben, auch meine Kolleginnen und Kollegen, haben Namen graviert. Das konkrete Ziel war, über die Namenstropfen auch haptisch Bezugspunkte für, für Jugendliche und für Erwachsene zu schaffen, wenn sie eben selbst die Möglichkeit bekommen, diese Namen zu gravieren. Und eben auch natürlich ergaben sich Fragen daraus. Was war das eigentlich für ein Name? Was, was war das für eine Person, die dahinter stand? Was hatte sie für eine Biografie? Es geht auch immer um die Frage der Bezüge zueinander, was eben sichtbar ist und was unsichtbar ist. Also beispielsweise in Rezurechlin gab es auch ein sehr großes KZ-Außenlager und da hat Zeitlupe beispielsweise auch in den letzten Jahren sehr viel investiert, gemeinsam mit Jugendlichen und der Gemeinde und dem Luftfahrttechnischen Museum in Rezurechlin eine Gedenkstätte einzurichten. Wir wollen selbsterforschendes Lernen stärken und wir wollen sowohl die Lehrkräfte als auch natürlich die Schülerinnen und Schüler motivieren, dass sie sich selbst auf Spurensuche begeben. Es gibt hier ein groß, großes Klinikum und es gibt eben auch Berufsschulen und diese Pflegeschule. Und die Pflegeschule haben wir dann eine Woche lang besucht. Sie haben ein Lernen aus der Geschichte versucht zu praktizieren. Es ging hier um medizinische Experimente im Frauen-KZ Ravensbrück. So der ganze Weg über die Woche lief im Grunde von historisch-politischem Lernen hin zur Menschenrechtsbildung und zur Auseinandersetzung mit menschenrechtlich relevanten Fragen im berufsspezifischen Kontext, wenn man so will. Das heißt, wir versuchen in die Lebenswelten, in die Arbeitswelten der Leute hineinzuwirken und sie darüber ähm, zu aktivieren und zu, äh, für historische Themen zu begeistern. Und es geht jetzt nicht äh, darum, irgendwelche historischen Themen zu finden, sondern tatsächlich Orte und Ereignisse, die mit unserer Lebenswelt, äh, mit unserer Umwelt äh, die, also direkt in Verbindung stehen äh, und diese ein Stück weit stärker an die Oberfläche zu holen und natürlich auch zu reflektieren. 
Zeitlupe hat eine große Chance, Vergangenheit und Zukunft gut miteinander hier zu verbinden, auch in, ja, in, in der biografischen Entwicklung der Kinder und Jugendlichen. Und da werden mit Zeitlupe ja auch unangenehme Themen irgendwie angefasst, wie Umgang mit Diskriminierung von Minderheiten oder von marginalisierten Gruppen, Menschenrechtsbildung oder äh, überhaupt die äh, Unveräußerlichkeit von Menschenrechten, die einzufordern. Da ist Zeitlupe eine super Möglichkeit, um ja, diese abstrakten Begriffe für Schülerinnen und Schüler und Kinder und Jugendliche tatsächlich auch mit Leben zu füllen. Also mein Ziel ist, dass die Menschen aufhören, einen Kranz niederzulegen und dann geschneuzt von dann zu gehen. Wenn ich das nicht schaffe, dass jede Generation neu die Frage beantwortet, wozu sollen wir uns überhaupt erinnern, wozu lernen aus der Geschichte, dann war ich nicht erfolgreich. Congratulations to Zeitlupe, Stadtgeschichte and Erinnerung on winning the this year's Obermeier Award. Now, Dr. Constanze Jaiser is with us. We just saw her in the film. Now, judging by the very strong words that you've used in the film, how do you manage to get so many young people involved? How do you inspire them? How do you get them to sign on? Yeah, well, I keep asking myself that question. Uh, first of all, thanks for that wonderful uh, video clip. It's the first time I've seen it. Well, to answer your question, maybe I can inspire young people because I am inspired by what I do. I just love meeting people, working together with people. But of course, I'm a teacher. And uh, from an educational point of view, it's very important for people to talk on an equal footing. And our project is ideally suited to investigate local history at the grassroots, at a grassroots level, because it touches people's personal lives. And it brings people together in a common endeavor. And it's wonderful to accompany them in this research and of course you get talking, people get talking to each other, I talk to them and uh, new ideas are born. People are inspired to test out, to try out new ideas and it's vital not to impose any moral principles on people. Of course I'm a very principled person, I have strong moral principles, but as has been pointed out in the film, it's very different. People learn at different speeds and you just need to give them space. Yes. Now you've pointed out it's very important to link these stories back to the personal lives of the people. If you look at history, you always have to find a personal approach. How do you manage to find that personal approach? Now, of course, there are very different ways of doing that. It all depends on the specific project. For instance, the nursing school that we saw in the film organizes excursions, for instance, where we talk, talked about a very interesting story about documents that were smuggled from the concentration camp of Rasen, Ravensbrück documents about the medical experiments that were conducted there. And that was a very, that was a thriller, basically. It was a very interesting project, and it is very important for people to think about the issues that are raised in these documents, to see that the human rights violations that were perpetrated back then to see them as such. And uh, of course I worked together with my colleagues Anja Schmidt in her media workshop, but we are not really the most important aspect. The group needs to do all the work itself. Now what does this change with regard to the outlook of the young people who come together in this project? Well, it does 
change a lot. It does make a difference. Uh, now, sometimes I do artistic work, artistic projects, sometimes very abstract historical projects, and you see, you can see the impact it has on the young people. I, of course, try to guide the process of learning, and it's always gratifying to see if the people actually change their way of thinking, their perspectives, and link these stories back to their lives. And Ruth Kohn, a renowned scholar about Jewish life who, who has researched a lot about Jewish life, has talked about this. So here you can see a process of empowerment, people growing in terms of their personality and their minds. And of course my prime focus is on people who do not get to the level of college, who would not go on to uh, study at college. They also have a right to learn. So you bring together a lot of pieces here. Here's the certificate that we'll send to you. Zeitlupe is one of this year's awardees. Constanze Eiser, congratulations again to you all, and all the best for your future work. Thank you. Mecklenburg is very grateful. I got a lot of positive feedback. Thank you so much. Now we'll get another chance to listen to Gal and Samo.
ein a traditional klezmer song to round off this year's Obermeyer Award Ceremony. Freilachsein was the title of the piece we've just heard, played by Samohuda and Ganiel Galop. So this brings us to the end of this year's Obermeyer Awards Ceremony. Thanks to all of you for your commitment and the outstanding work, and all the best to your future. Now at the end of today's event, I'd like to thank my co-moderator, Tony Toby Axelrod, to the jury members, and of course to the House of Representatives of Berlin. It's wonderful that we can host this ceremony every year here. And thanks to the President and Speaker of the House of Representatives, Dennis Buchner. I'll give the floor to him for his closing remarks. Thanks to all of you for watching. Mr. Buchner. Well, of course, I would also like to thank you, all of you at home. Thanks for watching. I hope you gained some valuable insights. And of course, I'd like to, family, I'd like to thank the family, the Obermeyer family, represented here by Joel family. Now, this project is very close to your heart, and it's wonderful to see you continue the project that was founded by your father, especially with uh, the Widen the Circle commitment. Now, we've seen the outstanding work that you've done, thanks to the team as well, to Shelley Kupferberg, but also the, to the technicians, and of course, to all the project organizers, because without their commitment, without their voluntary work, this would not have been possible. You all send a message for respect, for diversity, for tolerance, for the morals of one's own convictions. Now, we've seen that German life is vibrant here in Germany. It's part of everyday life in Germany, and many things have been achieved, many positive things have been set in motion over the past years, especially here in Berlin with the Jewish community. It is an integral part of our city. I'm looking forward to seeing you again next year at the Obermeyer Awards 2023, and I hope, of course, that we'll have an in-person event then here at the House of Representatives in Berlin, that all the awardees will come to Berlin, that we'll be able to talk face to face, and that we'll see many more encounters, inspiring encounters, inspiring meetings and projects in the future as well. Because it's not all about the awards, it's also about the awardees and to bring them in contact with each, with each other. Thanks and goodbye. See you next year.